can have one slide if I have time on uh, my uh, optimistic view of the future. Disclaimer and apologies, this is a personal view. It's not a balanced uh, history of the entire uh, research done in, in these decades. Uh, it's uh, based largely on my work and the work of my colleagues, students, and friends, and it's largely on modeling studies. I think that's the uh, uh, the purpose, the main purpose of this uh, of this workshop. And apologies to those I don't mention, I only mention briefly, and it's Bill Gray and the uh, uh, Arakao and many others. I'm not going to let you read that because if your name is not on there, you'll be mad at me. Um, if your name is not on there, I'm happy to put it on because like, I wasn't trying to uh, uh, put these names in priority order. Anyway, there's a lot of uh, great work that was done in the 60s, 70s, and 80s that uh, I won't mention. I will discuss uh, a little bit about the Simpsons contributions, hot towers and cumulus parameterization, linear studies of hurricane formation, uh, and early hurricane models, which uh, led to uh, MM5, then one slide on the future, as I mentioned. Just to set the context of hurricane modeling, I just want to mention two NWP milestones. Of course, the L.F. Richardson, everybody knows about him. Uh, the context of uh, uh, actually the uh, concept of weather prediction by numerical processes, published in 1922. And then the uh, Princeton uh, project, uh, the uh, uh, first computer forecast of the weather, Charney, Fjortoff, Freeman, Smagorinsky, and Plotsman, done on the ENIAC the 5th of March, um, 1950, was when the actual first computer forecasts were made. So before that, there were no uh, computer forecasts, there were no models. Uh, and the, uh, I highly recommend the book by Christine Harper, Weather by the Numbers, the Genesis of Modern Meteorology, and it's really a fascinating uh, history of the modernization of meteorology as a science uh, due largely to uh, numerical uh, modeling. And it's also a fascinating book because she doesn't pull any punches about the uh, rather strong personalities and opinions that were uh, uh, there in those days, uh, as I, they probably are No, we've outgrown all of that. Um, just to mention some early hurricane models, um, I just put this together uh, this morning, and so I'm probably, it's, again, it's uh, probably incomplete, but uh, Casahara 61, Uyama 64 with his uh, three-layer balanced uh, three-dimensional hurricane model, Ogura Yamasaki, Rosenthal with uh, two-dimensional models, and then uh, um, I published the uh, uh, first three-dimensional model using the primitive equations with Stan Rosenthal and Jim Trout in 1971. So the hurricane models were about 10 to 15 years uh, behind the uh, uh, global, um, or the, uh, the weather prediction models that the Princeton Project uh, worked on. I'd like to remind, since I'm an old timer now almost, uh, is that the, uh, you know, we knew a lot about hurricanes uh, in the uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, we knew that they were driven by the latent heat of condensation of water vapor. We knew that the uh, sensible and latent heating from the oceans was an essential process. That Without that, you wouldn't have hurricanes at all. And that we knew that uh, hurricanes caused upwelling and mixing uh, and cooling of the ocean surface over which they passed. It wasn't much known about the interactions and the fact that this could actually feed back in important ways, but uh, we did knew, know that uh, the work of uh, Dale Leiper and others at Texas A&M that um, the hurricanes could cause uh, upwelling and cooling. We also knew that the uh, uh, certain threshold of temperatures were needed uh, for hurricane formation. Uh, that goes back to uh, Eric Palmain and Herb Reel. We knew that there was, uh, had to be pre-existing cyclonic disturbances. They didn't just, hurricanes didn't just form out of nothing. Uh, low vertical wind shear was essential. Uh, there needed to be, uh, or at least it was more favorable if there's high absolute vorticity in the uh, lower troposphere. Uh, static stability was important and a moist environment was important. Uh, storms would not develop if the tropics were too dry. We still see uh, today some failures of hurricane genesis forecast because the initial conditions are too dry. Just a, a, a brief history of two remarkable people and the leaders of perhaps of tropical meteorology uh, for many, many years. Bob Simpson was born in 1912, so I, I guess that makes him 100 next year. And he's still uh, active and just sending emails around. Uh, Joanne was born in uh, 1923. I'm not going to read you their whole uh, histories. I don't have time, but um, they just uh, had a great career. Um, 
Bob Simpson in 1945 planned and conducted one of the first research missions to the eye of a hurricane. Uh, and you can read uh, uh, some of the things he's done. Again, this is not a complete list. In 2002, just uh, eight years ago, he was uh, the editor of uh, Hurricane Coping with Disaster. And Joanne, Joanne Simpson has a very long uh, record of fantastic achievements. Um, and there are just uh, many, many uh, wonderful stories about Joanne, uh, which I uh, won't get into, but you could do a whole lecture on Joanne's uh, wonderful history and her leadership and her mentorship of young people. I, um, uh, when I did a, uh, a talk and organized a symposium for the Simpsons at the AMS several years ago, I went through their apartment and found a lot of old clippings. And here's a picture of Bob Simpson published in the Washington Star in 1947. Uh, where um, he uh, describes his flight into uh, into a hurricane. This was hurricane forecasting before models. Um, the uh, this was a 19 uh, publication was in 1946. I guess the uh, is actually in 1944, uh, September 1944 weather maps. They were still doing constant height analyses. So this was a 10,000 foot and a 20,000 foot constant pressure analysis. Look at how few data points there are in that analysis. Even over the United States, there's only a few uh, radius on uh, plots of winds. And so uh, uh, remarkably, they had to uh, forecast uh, hurricanes from uh, not only purely qualitative and uh, methods and experience, uh, but uh, also with uh, much less data than we have now, in particular, no, no satellite data, certainly no, wet, no uh, numerical weather prediction. Bob Simpson uh, and Joanne also were, were terrific writers, and they wrote uh, wonderfully descriptive uh, stories about their experience with clouds and hurricanes. And this uh, uh, story published in uh, 1951 in the uh, Hawaii Weekly uh, talks about uh, Bob's flight into uh, Typhoon Marge. And it's a fascinating uh, story. Here's the uh, uh, track of Super Typhoon Marge. And uh, Bob actually flew into uh, that storm. And here is a picture that I'm not sure who took this, but uh, it's inside the eye, obviously. And he wrote some marvelous prose about the uh, uh, being inside the eye of this super uh, typhoon. <clears throat> picture of Bob and Joanne at uh, Roosevelt Roads in Puerto Rico in 1964. A uh, few of us, I think John Brown, you were probably at some of those, uh, those uh, flights. and. Uh, I was on some of them. We were uh, a lot younger then. Uh, Joanne and Bob, 1968, at the uh, Hurricane Center in Miami. Uh, here's Bob discussing hurricane tracks at NHC in uh, 1969. I remember Bob uh, fondly. Uh, you, you get older and you look back at, on people's influence on your career, and you think of them differently, at least I do now, than I did at the time. Um, Bob actually, when I went to Penn State, was director of the Hurricane Center, he gave me a $10,000 grant to work on data simulation in a hurricane model. Now that's amazing, he just did it. No, no proposal, no review, no nothing. He just had the power, <laughs> the power to do, uh, do a, do a, uh, you know, support, support a young guy with new ideas. And uh, you know, Bob was never a hurricane modeler. But uh, he uh, was willing to take a, uh, I don't know, $10,000 in 1970. What is it now? It's probably 100, worth 100000 It's probably. Anyway, Bob was a great guy. Uh, Joanne was a, a great woman. Of course, she was, uh, uh, they both flew, flew a lot in research aircraft. Um, I wanted to say a few words about hot towers. It was a major topic of research and theory in the 50s and 60s when I was uh, a graduate student and trying to learn about hurricanes from a weird position at the University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison, where I don't think they had, anybody had ever heard of hurricanes. Um, anyway, I got, got involved. Uh, Krish was uh, an important person in some of these uh, uh, early days. Uh, you'll remember the uh, talks. I wanted to show some examples of hot towers. How many hot towers do you see in this picture? Well, there's the clouds, and there's the two nuclear cooling plants, and a couple of smokestacks. I think there's actually two, four, six, seven hot towers in this picture. Most of them were on the ground. Um, anyway, hot towers, the concept has been known for a long time. This is from SB 1841. 
Uh, here's a picture of a, a sea breeze front, a hot tower uh, off the west coast of Florida. Um, a tall, skinny hot tower off the Florida coast. Uh, hot towers as they look from a uh, uh, plan view. This is Hurricane Frederick. Hot towers as they look from an RHI point of view. This is Hurricane Anita in 1977. So uh, hot towers were really the, uh, the, the thing of discussion. What I remember is that people oversimplified and, and they basically uh, thought that uh, everything was a hot tower. Uh, at those days, and that there was no uh, the, the basically stratiform precipitation, downdrafts, and those kinds of things, which are very important, were not uh, really given much consideration. But here's a, a, a famous paper by uh, Herb Reel and, and Malchus, Joanne Malchus, 1958, where she pointed out that uh, they pointed out that uh, cumulus, uh, deep, tall cumulus clouds could transport um, heat. Um, static, uh, moist static energy in this case against the mean gradient. In this case there's a mean gradient uh, from about two kilometers all the way up into the stratosphere and uh, if, uh, if the uh, equivalent potential temperature or the moist static stability was high enough at the surface uh, and a cloud originated close to the surface uh, it could uh, uh, transport uh, um, heat and uh, latent heat and uh, sensible heat against this uh, gradient, and if uh, it went on long enough, it could actually neutralize the, uh, the environmental sounding so that the entire sounding was uh, more or less a constant uh, equivalent potential temperature or a moist static energy. So I guess at that time they called them warm towers, but uh, the, um, uh, the first use I could find of, of uh, hot towers was uh, in, in the 1958 paper, um, and uh, uh, actually it was not published in 1960 in the Dynamics and Energy Transformation of Steady State Hurricanes. Um, so this led to um, a long period of years where uh, theoretical and numerical uh, atmospheric scientists who were looking uh, at trying to model hurricanes worked on the, the parameterization of cumulus convection in hurricane models. And here is a, uh, a statement that kind of gave people hope from the Real and Malchus 1961. Basically, it says if the details of these clouds are, uh, 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 you have to know the details of each one of these clouds, you're gonna, it's going to be a long time before we can make any progress because um, uh, we were nowhere as close to having cloud resolving uh, models at that time. So they offered the hope that if you could relate the statistical effects, the vertical transports of heat and uh, moisture and momentum to the larger scale variables which you could resolve in a low resolution model, then you uh, could uh, in effect get their, um, uh, their influence on the larger scale solutions and still come up with a, uh, a reasonable model. They uh, noted that uh, the large scale seemed to be very important in controlling the outbreak of, of cumulus convection, and that uh, in particular that the uh, active tropics uh, in terms of uh, cumulus convection occurred only where there was large scale synoptic uh, large scale synoptic scale convergence, and if there was divergence, uh, the uh, no matter how unstable the environment was, you didn't get any significant uh, cumulus convection. And so this again was kind of uh, gave hope to the modelers that if you could predict the synoptic scale motions, you could, uh, you could uh, somehow parameterize the important effect of the cumulus clouds. So the concept of cumulus parameterization is to relate the uh, interactions and feedbacks of cumulus convection on the larger scale. And the concept was supported by at least the supposition or the hypothesis that there was a clear separation of scales and that, uh, uh, that uh, the small scale was a slave to the, uh, to the large scale. And so these were the basis uh, for some of the uh, popular cumulus parameterization schemes. Well then the cumulus parameterization got mixed up with, uh, in a lot of people's mind, by, uh, with linear theories, with uh, conditional instability of the first and second kind, um, and then there was uh, the concept of cooperation versus competition. 
These issues were discussed hotly in many tropical conferences uh, over uh, at least two decades, mostly in the, in the 60s, uh, late 50s, and all through the 60s, maybe into the early 70s. Um, the linear theories which uh, people were, uh, theoreticians were trying to use to explain tropical cyclone genesis, uh, they assumed a um, small random, per as, as linear theories tend to do, uh, assumed small random perturbations in a conditionally unstable uh, stagnant base state. And then it was shown uh, all the way back to Bjergnes in 1938 that under these conditions, the most unstable modes were, the, were, were infinitely uh, narrow thin, small, uh, only with viscosity did you get some kind of uh, preferred growth rate at, a, at a, something like a cloud scale. So this is uh, the, the conditional instability that we all learned about in uh, sophomore dynamics or thermodynamics or whatever it was. And it's conditional instability of the first kind. Um, I think that uh, uh, this actually occurred in an early, early hurricane model. Uh, which uh, Akira Kasahara published in 1961. It was a two-dimensional model, and these show uh, vertical velocities at 32 hours, 64 hours, 96 hours, and 128 hours. And you can see that uh, he started out with a conditionally unstable atmosphere and a weak large-scale disturbance. And within a uh, few days, the, uh, the release of latent heat, which was done in an explicit way here, the model was trying to basically produce clouds. And this kind of verifies the linear theory that uh, the most unstable uh, modes were, the, uh, were these uh, uh, clouds. The, the, the model, uh, Kira's model was trying to produce clouds. If he had gone on for many, many more hours, this thing might have actually uh, somehow stabilized. But he gave up at 128 hours because it looked like uh, it was just uh, basically noise. But I think uh, some of the cloud resolving models today, the non hydrostatic models, are producing this kind of thing, but on a more realistic scale. This was just too coarse a grid to be, uh, to be realistic. Well, the linear theories were really not much relevance, as it turns out, because hurricanes develop from large scale pre existing disturbances. They don't start out with a stagnant base state, it's not random convection that somehow organizes itself. Development is non linear, the static stability evolves. Uh, and therefore, I really can't explain hurricane uh, development. The, um, so the, the linear theories and the conditional instability of the first kind led to uh, Charney and Elias and, and others, Uyama, uh, trying to explain a second kind of conditional instability, which was they called CISC. And uh, this was uh, when you bring in CISC, a linear uh, theories of hurricane development and, uh, um, and humanist parameterization. A lot of people mixed all this stuff up. Uh, and some people call CISC, for example, a, a cumulus type of cumulus parameterization. And you'd have many arguments late in the night uh, in the tropics, uh, hot and humid and beer and Bill Gray arguing and trying you know, about uh, how irrelevant all this was. And, uh, and it, just, it was kind of fun. Uh, but uh, people didn't really, um, weren't really in some ways careful. CISC was not a parameterization. It's also not uh, very relevant to hurricane formation, but the idea of the cooperation between cumulus scales and the hurricane scales of motion, I believe, is still highly relevant. Uh, I'm going to skip the quo parameterization, although uh, this was a widely used parameterization. It wasn't based on good <coughs> physical reasoning, as it turns out. But it was useful uh, because it did the job. It uh, converted a, a slightly conditionally unstable atmosphere to a more neutral, um, moist neutral uh, atmosphere. And that's what actually happened. So uh, you could look at it as an empirical uh, way of adjusting the uh, model, um, tropical model atmosphere toward what was actually observed. There are also moist convective adjustment, adjustment schemes which did the same thing. And neither were uh, particularly phys physically realistic. Yeah, five minutes, okay. So are hot tire towers um, uh, relevant? Well, I think they are. Without hot towers, uh, hurricanes would not exist. Without the latent heat of condensation, they would not exist. Um, I want to just finish then, then with the uh, 
Uh, some of my experiences with the early uh, hurricane models, the um, NHRL, National Hurricane Research Laboratory hurricane model, which led eventually to the uh, Penn State NCAR mesoscale model of version 5, which was uh, one of the uh, uh, most widely used uh, mesoscale models in the world until, until Wharf came along to replace it. Uh, here's some pictures of... Uh, of uh, me and my friends and colleagues there. Uh, that's Russ D'Souza, Xavier uh, Bill Proenza, um, Jim Koss. August 1965, I used to fly into hurricanes, and that's why I became a modeler. <laughs> um, here's some, I didn't uh, develop, of course, MM5 by myself. Here are some key people uh, who, uh, from 1999, who uh, 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 played major roles in the uh, in the development, in um, Greg said, anyway, "I want you to I want to sh you to show us the early grid structure. Why you cut off the corners? And here it is, uh, Greg. The uh, the hand drawn uh, diagram that uh, for the f the 3D hurricane model, where I chopped off the four corners, uh, not only to save 10 percent of the time in the, in the storage, but also to uh, uh, eliminate the uh, to have a quasi-round environment. I didn't want stuff piling up in the corners like they uh, tended to do. So um, spiral rain bands came out of this model. I was very excited to see. This is uh, what we had to do in those days to see the models. They actually had to color the uh, printer output with the uh, crayons. And so there's the eye walls, that red thing, and then the, the green bands. Uh, it was line printer output. I did get NCAR to uh, give time to a NOAA, a NOAA guy to compute trajectories on the NCAR computer, which is very nice. Uh, the thing that I look back on and I'm kind of most proud of is this handmade uh, visualization of spiral rain bands, uh, which is one of the, uh, f it, was the first it was the first model to produce spiral rain bands. It was also one of the f earliest animations of atmospheric model output. And what I did is I printed out the damn line printer every 15 minutes. And then I used, I think it was Charlie Newman's uh, camera that pointed down, it was up in the fifth floor, and took a, a picture, every, you know, eight frames every, of every one of these things. It took me several days to, uh, to do, but it actually uh, looks pretty good. Hey, Rick, I still have the 15-minute gravity wave. The 15-minute what? <laughs> Yeah, okay. So anyway, this, uh, that was the graphics, and you'll see, uh, um, I just wanted to point out, um, well, what, I thought I had a, oh, here was the, uh, here was the computer we had to work with. The, the grid of the 3D model was 30 by 30 by 3, less 10% corners, so for a total of 2,430 grid points. Now, you know, this is like you'd walk, walk to school 10 miles each day. Each way was uphill, and snow got deeper each day. Um, in, the, uh, in, in 1976, the uh, computers had gotten better, and we were up to 9,600 grid points. That was on the CDC 7,600, uh, doing some uh, MM, early MM simulations. And then uh, Dalin Zhang, um, a uh, former uh, student of mine and Mike Fritch's, uh, in 1998, uh, really uh, it had advanced, showed how far hurricane modeling had advanced. And he had, uh, could use 600,000 grid points, which is 270 times as many as the original hurricane model. So when you complain, you guys that are doing hurricane modeling today about how little computer power, you know, complain to somebody else. Um, and so now we have uh, these wonderful things, which I don't, uh, I mean, aren't those nice graphics? And look at those rain bands. And there's is a, you know, I won't show you all of these. Anyway, they're all uh, beautiful graphics, and uh, these are real data forecast, of course. Uh, I'll just close with my, uh, my outlook in the future, and I've, I've been an optimist in, in terms of uh, numerical weather prediction and numerical prediction of hurricanes. Um, my forecast, written down, you can look at it in five years, that uh, very soon the actual operational forecast model will contain interactive oceans, explicit cloud physics, they'll resolve clouds, rain bands, and the eye wall with a resolution of, uh, on the order of 500 meters. Um, that the track accuracy, and I think the later, later talks will show the improvement, well, they'll continue to improve, but especially beyond three days. 
I think tropical cyclogenesis will be routinely and correctly presented by, uh, predicted by operational models, and there'll be a dramatic increase in accuracy of intensity forecast, and I say imminent, within five years. Why do I think that? Well, the models will have the resolution, the physics will be there, uh, and most importantly, the uh, global observations will be there, uh, particularly the new systems like radio occultation, which give you moisture uh, information over the tropics, I think will be very important. And then the, uh, maybe the pessimistic one is that the relationship between tropical cyclone formation and intensity and climate change will continue to be a very important topic of research for many years. And with that, I thank you.